Hey everyone, Squeaks and I were just outside enjoying the day when Squeaks asked me a question. Do you wanna tell them what your question was, Squeaks? That's right, he asked me why the sky is blue. And that's what I like to call an epic question. Epic questions are big, important questions about things in our world that we see, feel, or think about almost every day. You've probably asked an epic question yourself, and you might even know the answer to some of them. But learning the hows and whys behind epic questions can help us understand the universe we live in. Let's start by answering your question, Squeaks, and we can think of more epic questions in the meantime. Do you ever lie on your back outside on a sunny day? There's just so much to see. There are birds and airplanes and maybe even clouds all way up in the pretty blue sky. But why is the sky blue? Why not green or red or any other color? It all starts with light from our big bright sun. Now it may not look like it, but the light from the sun is made of all the colors of the rainbow. And you might already know that it takes many colors to make up a rainbow red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. All of the colors of the rainbow are in sunlight all of the time. It's just that they're all mixed together so we usually don't see them. It's kind of like when you're painting and you mix together all the colors. With paint, mixing all the colors makes brown. But when you mix together all the colors of light, you get white light. And you can actually see the different colors in light sometimes. One way to do it is by using a tool called a prism, which is usually just a specially shaped piece of glass or plastic. But you can even make a prism out of a glass of water. Prisms bend light in a special way so that we can see all of the colors that make up light. Say that I shine a bright flashlight into a prism. The rays of light move in a straight line away from the flashlight. When the light hits the prism, it separates into lots of different colors and we have a rainbow. So the light is white when it moves in a straight line until it hits the prism. Then it bends and we see all the colors. That's a little like what happens to the light from the sun. Rays of light leave the sun in a straight line too as they move through space. They stay in a straight line until they reach the layer of air that surrounds the earth. Now the air around the earth is made of tiny little particles or pieces that we can't see, but they're there. If you try moving your hand back and forth really quickly through the air, you'll feel the air moving past your hand. What you're really feeling is all those little particles. When the rays of light hit these tiny particles of air, they don't just bend like they did when they hit the prism. The light rays scatter, meaning that they go off in lots of directions and bounce around. And here's the cool thing. Some of the colors scatter more than others. What color do you think scatters more? Right you are, Squeaks. Blue. Blue is one of the colors of light that scatters the most. So as light from the sun moves into the air that's way high up, the blue colored light bounces all over the place in the sky. So the next time you're outside, don't forget to look up and remember all that has to happen to make the sky blue. A lot of epic questions seem like they have easy answers, but a lot of things like the sky being blue are more complicated than you'd think. Did you think of any other epic question squeaks? Why is fire hot? That's a perfect epic question. Fire is definitely hot, but what's going on there? What are the flames made of? Where does all that heat come from? What do you think, Squeaks? No, fire isn't alive, but that's a good guess. Living things do make heat and move just like fire, but fire doesn't have babies and it doesn't respond to the world around it like living things do. Here's Jesse to answer our epic question. The weather has been getting pretty cold around here lately. It's almost winter and there's already lots of snow on the ground. One of the things we like to do when it's cold and snowy outside is sit around the fort's fireplace. We can drink hot chocolate, tell stories, and sometimes we even roast marshmallows. It's so nice and warm. But we have some very important rules about being around fires, don't we Squeaks? We know to never get too close to any kind of fire or play with matches or the stove. I'm sure a lot of you know these rules too. Some of you wanted to know more and asked us why fire is so hot. That's a really good question. Fire is very hot, which is one of the reasons we don't go near it. And that heat 
comes from energy. You might already know a little bit about energy. It's the reason things move and change. Like when Squeak starts bouncing all around the fort, I like to say that he has a lot of energy. We get the energy we need from food we eat, and we use that energy to move and change when we do things like playing and growing. The energy we use when we move is one type of energy, and heat is another type of energy. That's why we get so warm sometimes when we're running around a lot. As we run, we use up some of the energy we got from our food, and we get warmer at the same time. Fire is kind of like that too. When something burns, like wood in a fireplace, it changes. It starts out looking like regular wood from a tree, and then after it burns, it becomes all black. Sometimes it also gets broken up into smaller pieces that we call charcoal. As the wood changes, it uses up energy, and at the same time, it gives off heat. The heat that comes from a fire happens because of something called combustion. That's a big word, but it just means what's going on when something is burning. For something to burn or combust, three things need to happen. First, there has to be something to burn, like the wood in the fireplace. We call the stuff that burns in a fire fuel. Second, there needs to be something called oxygen, which is a part of the air that's all around us. Oh, you're right, Squeaks. Fire isn't the only thing that needs oxygen. We need it too. We take oxygen into our bodies every time we take a breath of air. The third thing that fire needs is actually heat. Yeah, fire needs a little bit of heat to get started. If you've ever watched a grown-up light a candle on a birthday cake or start a campfire, they might have used a match. It's the heat from the match that gets combustion and the fire started. Then the fuel burns and changes and gives off much, much more heat than it started with from that tiny match. It's using up lots of energy as it burns, and some of that energy comes out as heat. But when the fuel in a fire is all burned up, there's nothing nothing left to change and give off that heat. So if all the wood burns up in our fireplace, the fire will go out. But while it's burning, it's very hot. And now you know why. It's because it's giving off energy. You're right, Squeaks, it is amazing. Now, I'm out of hot chocolate, so I'm gonna go fill it up and I'll meet you back at the fireplace. You thought of another question while we were watching that? Great, what is it? Whoa, where did the earth come from? That is one of the most epic of epic questions, and it seems like that would be pretty hard to answer, since there was no one around, right? But scientists have found some clues that give us a pretty good idea of what happened. Let's check it out. Squeaks and I have been reading all of the great questions you've sent us. Some are about animals, the weather, our bodies, and even about physics. You're all so smart and so curious, and we love getting these questions. We noticed that lots of you want to know where the Earth came from, and that's a really good question with a really cool answer. It came from a huge cloud in space. Oh, that's true, Squeaks. The Earth formed billions of years ago, so we don't have any pictures or videos to see it happening. But we can figure out what happened based on some clues. You might already know that the Sun is a star, and that Earth is a planet moving around the Sun, as well as Mars and Venus and a bunch of others, eight planets in all. Together, the Sun and everything moving around it make up our solar system. By learning about the solar system and by looking at what's happening around other stars where planets planets are first forming now, scientists can get a pretty good idea of where the sun and planets like Earth came from. And it all started out as a giant cloud of dust and gas, all floating together in space. Scientists think that more than four billion years ago, that enormous cloud got a really big shock. We don't know exactly what caused it, but it could be that a nearby star exploded. Whatever it was, that faraway explosion shook the whole dust cloud. And as the cloud shook, all of the dust and gas inside began to move closer together. Some of the dust and gas in the center squished together, and as more and more dust and gas got squished inside it, the middle of the cloud became very big, very thick, and very, very hot. Can you think of what's in the middle of our solar system that's very hot? Oh, that's right, the sun. The dust at the center of the cloud got squished together so much that it started burning up, and it became our star, the sun. Even back then, the sun was so big and so heavy that it was able to pull things closer to it 
just by being there. This was because of a force called gravity, the same thing that pulls you back down to the ground when you jump. A force is anything that's a push or pull. Like if I pull on Squeak's arm, I'm putting a force on him. Gravity is a force just like that. It pulls little things like us close to big things like the Earth, almost like a magnet. It's always there, pulling us to the ground and keeping things on Earth from floating into space. And billions of years ago, gravity also pulled what was left of the cloud of dust and gas towards the sun. The dust and gas slowly began to swirl in a circle around the sun. It looked a bit like a big disk or a flat circle. It was starting to look a lot more like our solar system, but the planets were still missing. Over time, everything in the disk moved into different rings around the sun. And then the dust and gases in the rings began to clump together because something was pulling on them. You got it, gravity was pulling everything together. The clumps of dust and gases started to get bigger and bigger until eight of these clumps basically became baby planets. Over thousands of years, the baby planets gathered more and more material with their gravity until they became the eight planets of our solar system. And today, each planet still moves around the sun, just like when it was a young, growing planet. It is amazing how much the Earth has changed since then. Everything around us used to be just pieces of dust floating around in space. And now it's this huge, amazing planet with all kinds of incredible things living on it, including us. There's always more to learn about the planet we call home and about space where all the other planets are. Maybe tonight we can get a closer look at some of them through our telescope. Okay, this time I have an epic question. Why do we dream when we sleep. Do you have any ideas, Squeaks? It's okay not to know the answer. And you know what? Scientists don't really know either. That's right. There's a lot about our brains that we don't know, including why they create dreams. Let's learn more about what scientists know so far. <sighs> oh, hey, Squeaks. I just woke up from the weirdest dream. You were there and so was our friend Dino, except he was a full grown dinosaur. I think he was a T-Rex. <sighs> Strange, I wonder where that came from. Dreams can seem confusing sometimes, but scientists think that we have them for a reason. When we go to sleep at night, it can look like our bodies and our brains are turning off. But while the rest of your body is resting and recharging, your brain is actually working pretty hard. And it shows you dreams kind of like a movie going on inside your head. When you're dreaming, some parts of your brain are switched on and working hard, like the ones that think about what you see and some of the parts that focus on your feelings. Meanwhile, the part that does some of your more complicated thinking, like by asking great questions like why you're suddenly able to fly, for example, is turned off. So if you're flying in your dream, you can just enjoy the ride. While you sleep, your brain is going through a bunch of different steps, then starting over from the beginning. That happens a few times every night. At first, you sleep very lightly. You might feel like you're still awake, even while you're dozing off. Then your brain starts to slow down a little more. Your sleep gets a little deeper. You might have a few dreams, but they're more likely to be about what you were doing that day. Nothing too weird. But then comes the weirdest part of the night. During this step, your breathing and your heartbeat slow down a little. Your body is completely still, but behind your eyelids, your eyes are moving around a lot in what we call rapid eye movement or REM sleep for short. REM sleep is really important for your body and it's when you'll have the most epic story-like dreams and the ones that you'll remember best in the morning. Some people remember lots of details from their dreams and some people don't. But even if you don't remember your dreams, very well, you still have them. Everybody does, and some other animals do too. All mammals, animals like dogs and cats and humans and rats, experience REM sleep, and so do some birds. During sleep, our brains sort out all the information we've been taking in while we're awake. Some of your dreams might be about things that happen during the day, like playing with your friends at school. But then, your dreams can start to jump into all kinds of wacky stories. Maybe you're bouncing around on the moon, or having a conversation with a giant dog Lemon. So why do our brains put on this big production for us every night? We may never know for sure, but scientists have a few ideas. Over the course of a day, you're hearing and seeing and smelling millions of little details about the world around you. And while you sleep, your brain needs to find the most important things you've just learned so that it can store it away in your memory for good. 
That way, you'll be able to remember it for years. Some scientists think that that's what dreams are for. They help you figure out the most important things you learned during the day. That helps you remember them and connect them with things that you've learned before, so that you're ready to learn more new things tomorrow. We might also need dreams to help us sort out the feelings we've had during the day. If you've been scared or worried about something, you might have a dream about being scared or worried about a different thing at night to help you work out how you feel. That might help you be more prepared to tackle the scary thing the next morning. Other scientists don't think that dreams are related to memories or feelings at all. Even though your brain still needs sleep to sort out your feelings and memories, it could be that the movies you see in your dreams just come from your brain calming down after a long day. Some people try to use dreams to help them figure out what's bothering them or to help them solve problems. A lot of creative people, like people who write songs or make movies and even scientists, get their ideas from dreams. They connect what they've been thinking about during the day to what they already know. And in their dreams, they'll suddenly have an awesome idea. No matter what our brains use dreams for, we know that we need sleep to help us learn and to help us feel great when we wake up. And on that note, I am ready to go back to bed and back to whatever adventure my brain has waiting for me when I fall asleep. How about you, Squeaks? There are plenty of other epic questions we don't know the answer to. Maybe some of you watching out there will be the ones to figure out the answers. Ah, Squeaks has one more epic question. What is it? What's for lunch? <laughs> now that is a good question. Let's head to the kitchen and see what we've got. Thank you all for joining us today. If you have some epic questions for us, you can ask a grown-up to help you send them. They can get started at patreon.com slash scishowkids. We'll see you next time here at the Forge.